Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. I'm uh, Brahima Kulubali, senior fellow here and uh, the director of the, of the Africa program. Um, so we're really pleased uh, to have you with us and uh, to also be able to partner with, uh, with UNIDO to hold this event on uh, the Industrial Revolution and its implications for Africa. It's otherwise known as Industry 4.0. Uh, what we're noticing is that much of that discussion hasn't really touched on what this really means for Africa. And we thought today's event would uh, help us a bit beginning to uh, get that conversation going. Um, so as you know, Industry 4.0 is defined as uh, by a wide range of uh, sectors, including artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, cloud computing, internet of things, etc. And it has been really disruptive in various sectors around the world. And Africa hasn't really been uh, an exception. Uh, one example is mobile penetration, which has been quite rapid. But now that platform is being used uh, to deliver ICT-based uh, services and creating new jobs uh, in, uh, in services. So then, the, but it's also been having some uh, um, unwelcome effects, at least uh, as far as automation is concerned and it's what it's doing to jobs. And we know in Africa, job creation is really the top priority. Um, so if automation is taking away some of, uh, some of the jobs, how does Africa uh, basically take advantage of the opportunities of Industry 4.0 while at the same time managing uh, its, uh, uh, unwelcome, its unwelcome effects? I believe that the challenges we have in Africa are daunting, and to nonlinear challenges, we really require the kind of nonlinear solutions that technology uh, affords. Um, so then we have a really great, uh, excellent panel with us today of experts who would help us uh, sort of unpack this issue. Uh, but before we turn it over to uh, Jake Bright, the moderator, who is also an expert in uh, uh, business and uh, technology in Africa, uh, I'll welcome my colleague from uh, the UN office of UNIDO to provide brief remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Paul Marcelli. I'm the director of UNIDO's office in New York. Uh, it's a great privilege for me to be here with you this morning at this event, which brings together the public, private sector, and development practitioners to discuss the implications, uh, challenges, and opportunities of Industry 4.0 for Africa. Mm and also to prefer um, policy recommendations on how African countries can harness the transformative potential of um, this um, new development to tackle the huge development challenges facing the continent. Uh, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to our host and co-organizer, the Brookings African Growth Initiative, we are proud to partner with this institute that have been at the forefront of research aimed at finding innovative solutions to Africa's most pressing issues. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Africa today is at a crossroad. We are at a nexus period where the global scale of the internet, the ubiquity of mobile devices, and the ever-decreasing cost of cloud services are working together to create an increasingly interconnected world. And in the process, revolutionizing all spheres of human activities, um, be it politics, society, culture, and the economy. This digitalization of the economy through increasing use of digital technologies is changing the global landscape of manufacturing and has ushered in what is now known as Industry 4.0. However, as with any new trend, it also brings new challenges and opportunities. And we've deliberately chosen the title of this um, event, Industry 4.0, in Africa, help re helping or hindering it to indicate that um, the, f the, the, the outcome for Africa is not given, that I mean, choices have to be made. And the, it will depend in the end on whether the continent embrace and prepare for this new development or just stand as a passerby. Let me state from the outset that it is imperative for Africa to industrialize. History shows that no country 
has reached an advanced stage of economic and social development without an advanced industrial sector. The question then is how can Africa industrialize within the context of um, increasing digitalization? Without, we've assembled a formidable panel to discuss these issues and without attempting to preempt the discussion, please allow me to just posit about three issues that I think would be very critical for African countries as they confront this challenge. First, they must address the infrastructure challenges. Uh, manufacturing in any form will not thrive without adequate infrastructure. Using internet penetration as a proxy for de digitalization, Develop developing countries still, developed countries still dominate the internet economy with a staggering 78% share overall. Of the countries with less than 10% internet penetration, most are African. In fact, the ec internet economic contribution to GDP in developed countries is more than three times that of Africa countries. These stati statistics suggest that the capability of African countries to be competitive in a dig digitali digitalized trade is low. African countries will therefore have to strengthen its traditional infrastructure as well as develop the digital and technological ecosystem that will be essential to compete and participate in the 21st century economy. Second, they must have the right policies in place. And these policies must be able to reconcile the tension between the present state of industrial development, the low state of industrial development today, and the high requirement of a digitalized economy. Um, the availability, uh, as many countries in the continent are still on the path of industrialization, the impacts of increased digitalization may be limited in comparison to that of their developed counterparts. If you take the deployment of robots, for example, this may not necessarily be economically competitive for African countries. And African abundant cheap labor may still constitute an important comparative advantage, at least in the short term. In the textile and garment manufacturing, which is usually the starting point for late industrializers, the estimate is that only about 20 to 25% of the apparel industry will eventually be automated. Having said this, um, the power of technology to bring about disruptive change must not be underestimated. Digitalization can indirectly impact African countries in the long run by affecting global competition and changing the criteria of what constitutes an attractive manufacturing location. I think already we are seeing some signs of it with reshoring, as we have the case of Adidas um, and Philips, I mean, reshoring operation back to the north. It is thus essential for African countries not only to adopt and implement the right policies to boost manufacturing, but also to adapt to the changing nature of manufacturing. In short, they must be prepared for a digital future. Mm. Finally, Africa will still find a niche in manufacturing. Uh, they could adapt a dual track approach by strengthening their position in high value added manufacturing in less automated sectors like textile, food, beverage, tobacco, metals, wood, and paper industries, and at the same time building their industrial capabilities while preparing for the digital future by investing now in the internet, digital technologies, and targeted skill developments and innovation. Mm. My organization, UNIDO, stands ready to assist African countries with fostering Industry 4.0 through our knowledge sharing and project development platform, through retrofitting established industrial systems, as well as fostering innovation, innovative collaboration between the public and the private sector. Mm -hmm. I look forward to a stimulating dis discussion with the distinguished panel of experts. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.
Well, I'll get started. Uh, good reception. Everybody can hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you, Brookings. Thank you, uh, Brookings Africa Initiative, Brahima, Christina. I'm so happy to be here today for the topic, uh, Industry 4.0 in Africa, Helping or Hindering. And I consider this topic to be, if you know, we're doing uh, things with 4.0 and, and numbers, I consider it to be kind of cutting edge squared in that uh, we're talking about very cutting edge topics, AI, nanotechnology, digitization, uh, electronic industry, but we're also talking about it in a cutting edge way in that these things are probably, by many accounts, some of the least associated uh, terms that many people would connect with Africa. So that's great. Uh, what I'll do today is I'll start by just introducing very quickly the panelists, and then I'm also going to let them introduce themselves and say a couple things about what they've been working on most closely to this topic. And then we'll dive into a discussion, uh, Q&A, and then there'll also be some time for Q&A for all of you. So let's get started. Uh, just to do a quick flyby on the panelists, I'll go from left to right, or I'll go from, from my left. Uh, we have Susan Lund, who is, uh, runs actually McKinsey Global Institute. And then we have Julius Akinyemi, who's entrepreneur in residence at MIT uh, Media Lab. Then we have Mary Hallward Dreimeyer, I got it right, who's a senior economic advisor in finance competitiveness and innovation at the World Bank. And then we have Olga Mamedovich, who's chief, uh, I'll let you do the rest of your title, but chief at UNIDO, United Nations Industrial Development Organization. So why don't we start with Susan? Uh, Susan, could you just say a little bit, you can say a little bit about yourself and then some of the work that you've done that's most closely affiliated with these industry 4.0 topics in Africa? Um, okay, well thank you first of all for inviting me. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to be here today talking about this topic. So my interest in Africa goes back many decades now. Uh, to, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in West Africa and that started my long-term interest in the continent. Uh, I was in Guinea-Bissau, which I bet most people in this room cannot say they were in. Yeah. And sadly, Guinea-Bissau is not at the cutting edge of Industry 4.0. But now I'm an economist by training. I uh, work at the McKinsey Global Institute. We are the economics research arm of the global consulting firm. Um, my own research focuses on two areas, I think, related to this topic. Uh, the first has been on the impact of digital finance to promote financial inclusion and women's empowerment and the potential for mobile money, um, digital financial accounts, et cetera, to, to really have a revolution in financial inclusion in a way that bricks and mortar banking don't. Um, and the second topic is about the impact of automation and robotics and artificial intelligence on the future of work. And in that area, my work has focused mainly, we've really done very detailed work on what it means for the US and Europe and advanced economies where it's very pressing. But I think that there are ripple effects on what this means for the future of industrialization in Africa um, as a result. Thank you. Julius? Sure. Um, good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here as an African boy. And I know it's a long way from uh, a small village in uh, Nigeria compared to MIT. Uh, obviously, we cannot take out the effect of MIT, so you can take the boy out of the village, but <laughs> not the village out of the boy, so to speak. Um, a lot of, uh, coming from Africa, my uh, grandfather was a farmer. Um, I know by experience and you know, by, in terms of how difficult it is for uh, rural farmers uh, to have connectivity, to be able to get adequate price for their produce. And when we talk about financial inclusiveness, which I believe is one of the key missing elements you know, in, in the uh, uh, industrialization for Dotto, and also to be able to build trust. And uh, I'm kind of trying to lay out some of these issues because uh, lack of trust is one of the pillars of poverty. And because of that, there are now technologies that are enabling us to be able to, uh, to remedy that. So one of the things we are doing out of MIT uh, is, of course, you know, there's the connectivity at the back end. If you can connect, uh, regardless of how good or how efficient the internet is, if you don't have connectivity, you cannot do anything on it. 
And we still have a lot of uh, uh, lack of connectivity on the African continent today. So we are working on that in terms of the last mile connectivity, leveraging different kinds of technology. Secondly, um, looking at how the rural farmers actually uh, uh, function, one of the key assets of the, of, the I mean, of the continent is the agricultural produce. Africa still has the largest arable land on the planet today. So if you are thinking in terms of productivity, feeding yourself, um, biodiversity of the planet, it has to be in Africa. And fortunately, I was privileged to be talking with uh, about 400 uh, doctorate and postdoctorate researchers at MIT last week. And everyone is anxious to go to Africa and, and, and do their research. And I said, why? They said, well, you know, that's the last mile. That's the last place where we can still have pristine areas to be able to, to, to partner. So uh, in terms of that, how we actually empower the uh, producers is another key issue. So we are leveraging the new technology, the blockchain, and I will talk more about that in future. Uh, in order to allow the farmers to be able to register their assets, so we call that the digitization of the asset, and also allow them to be able to trade that. I used to tease my friends that I don't need to be in Chicago Merchantile Exchange to be able to sell my goat at Adoikiti. So that's the kind of platform we are providing. When you combine uh, um, blockchain with mobile platform and also building trust, and I will talk about the trust machine later, uh, that basically empowers you to be able to move forward. So let me stop there for the time being. And OK, thank you. Mary? Great. Thank you very much. Likewise, really pleased uh, to be here today. Uh, so I have been at the World Bank now for 20 years and working uh, on Sub-Saharan Africa probably for 12. My area is more on sort of entrepreneurship and private sector development. And most recently, really looking at this intersection of new technology and what does it mean for jobs? What does it mean for entrepreneurship? And what might it mean for the sort of historical, traditional development model of going from agriculture into light manufacturing, sort of heavy manufacturing, into services? So uh, with a co-author, had a book out this fall called Trouble in the Making, question mark, uh, the future of manufacturing-led development. And that question mark being a really key part of the title. Uh, and I think for Africa, it does, there's sort of two different dimensions. One is sort of how disruptive it is given the current state of the economy now, and how disruptive might it be given what other countries and other regions are doing. And I think the issue within manufacturing, in part because it still is a fairly nascent sector in most countries in, in the region, is it's much less a concern of current jobs being disrupted and automated away, which is something that is more likely to be happening here, and much more a question about the, the onshoring. Or say if China, which is at this point produces 25% of global manufacturing value added and is very heavily invested in automating and a lot of new technologies, you know, if there is more of this onshoring and automation in middle, upper middle and high income countries, you may not have the same sort of flying geese pattern of manufacturing moving into lower cost areas. So what does that mean for Africa? And, and I think in your introduction, you had a, a number of really important points of, of differences across sectors. You know, new technology is being used very differently across different sectors. So there's still opportunities using industry 2.0, even if not 1.0, uh, which gives a window of opportunity to get some of that industrialization happening. Because uh, one of the things we've been looking at is this potential for leapfrogging. And often when people say leapfrogging, they pick up their mobile phone. Mm -hmm. And I think in the services, uh, the potential for that is much greater. And in manufacturing, it's not as clear. Uh, and so then we're looking at, does that matter? And what are the scope still for, for progress within manufacturing? But how can services be a new engine for development? And a lot of potential for that in the region. Thank you. Olga? Thank you. Thank you uh, for inviting you, Nido, and working for Nido on a very important topic. And, um, uh, I have been uh, in touch with this topic uh, most recently in the context of a G20 work on industrialization in Africa under the Chinese presidency and most recently under the German presidency when with, within the context of development working group the issue was to produce the report on industrialization in Africa and LDCs. 
And the critical questions also was, okay, whether the uh, positive question, industrialization, is important for Africa, yes or no? And if it is important, what to do about it? So that's, if we go business as usual, linear models, then what are the in instruments of industrial policy for that? And then comes the new industrial revolution, which is challenging even this linear path. And we work and live in very compressed development. There are no stages of economic development. So what would be the, po the normative side of prescriptions for Africa to go in the future? So this report has a very big challenge to answer this question because the development working group has also addressed the issues of new industrial revolution and what would be the consequences for Africa. I must say that I agree with, the, uh, first of all, I agree with all the other panelists that it is a neglected topic and not discussed very well in international fora discussion. And I came from the row of discussion on Industry 4.0 in the last three uh, weeks. And whenever I ask the question of what will be the, uh, let's say, the sense of foresight for the other panelists, you do, will receive very, almost none answer. Because people have under-researched this topic. There are practitioners that have been working in Africa and they are pessimistic, there are those that are optimistic. But one could conclude one thing, that you cannot marginalize Africa from new technological trends. They are happening, they are happening very fast and exponentially. So Africa will have to, have to embrace this slowly. And as you said, Industry 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, there is a lot of scope for uh, improvement even on the 3.0. Kaizen technology and the level of manufacturing can go hand in hand with new sensors and technologies. On the positive side, also, technology is not so expensive. It's cheap. It is a lot of embedded knowledge in it. So if you need a little training to use this new technology, you don't need to repeat the whole cycle of innovation to be able to use this technology. The point is that Africa should not be uh, marginalize in terms of learning this new technology, building awareness, what does it mean for Africa, for different groups of countries in Africa. There are two di diversified group of countries from um, upper middle income countries to middle income countries, low income countries, then you have LDCs category. Among the LDC, you have high income country and so on. Oil rich countries, resource rich countries and, and so forth. But one is definitely true that contribution of manufacturing to GDP has been decreasing over the years. So if solution for Africa is industrialization, one has to look on what is the future of manufacturing on the global level, and then what is the future of manufacturing for Africa. Thank you, Olga. So we'll definitely come back to manufacturing. I wanted to start uh, with a question for Julius, and, and anybody else can add if they'd like. But it has to do with connectivity. So, you know, so frequently talk about digital industries and technology in Africa, but the baseline for all of this is connectivity. There are some high points. Uh, you have uh, some countries that have done a pretty good job of getting high internet penetration, getting PDA um, penetration up to around 50%, getting costs down, cost down. But at the same time, when you look at uh, Africa as a continent, it still is roughly at about one third. Yes. of the continent at internet uh, penetration or access to the internet. So it's still pretty bad on a global perspective. So Julius, you know, your sense of the state of connectivity, internet connectivity on the continent, and maybe models that um, have worked or what you think should happen right. to increase the state of connectivity and affordability of internet in Africa. Right, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, definitely, that's one of the a uh, key element of infrastructure, and uh, we cannot get to 4.2 without connectivity. Connectivity in terms of, I mean, it enables us to be able to digitize and it enables us to be able to connect. And um, when mobile technology first came on board, everybody thought, well, that's too expensive for Africa. And I, I will give a specific example for Nigeria, as for example. Um, I remember when uh, I believe uh, Motorola or one of, I mean, Nokia actually, uh, when they went to Nigeria, they said, well, you know, we just give them the little, you know, uh, talk phones. And they find out that the little talk phones doesn't work because they, all of a sudden, the, the people find out that, well, they need a better phone to be able to perform a lot of the functions. And most of what we take days to accomplish now takes minutes on the phone to be able to, do, to get done. So the, the value of connectivity 
has been cemented on their head that, look, I have to connect to be able to do anything. Things that took me a long time to do, I can now do in seconds. So that in mind, and then you catapult yourself into where we are today. Yes, you are right. About 67% of average on the continent is the penetration level. You have levels that are even less than 10%. And because of that, you don't have all the advantages. When we talk about infrastructure capabilities, you need those connectivity to be able to make the infrastructure work and to be able to connect people that are selling you know, to the people that want to buy. And uh, in terms of bridging that information asymmetry, that allows you to be able to gain the benefit of pricing and, uh, and the revenue and, and so on. So, when I talk about trust, all of that is also embedded in that because if I don't see you and I can't transact with you, there's no trust. But if I can call you and I know you and I connect with you, that trust is there. And that builds you know, a, a, a relationship that catapults us into a different level of business dealing. So on each business dealing we have improves the GDP. And on, I mean, most recently, part of what we are doing on that level is uh, most of you may not know, you know, up to today, there is no uh, intellectual property assigned to indigenous plants around the world, Africa inclusive. But these are big assets. So how does that connect to connectivity? Now, in the past, you know, when we talk about big data, and, you know, I, I think that was a report, we were just talking about that this morning. Uh, you know, 2011, we wrote a report on big data, personal data, a new class of assets. I think it was with uh, Mackenzie, there were a few of us from MIT, Harvard, and so on. But the point about that is you need that data, and you cannot get, get that data without connectivity. The moment we started mobile uh, connectivity, there were a huge amount of data from rural areas, med you know, from health, from agricultural farming, you know, maybe not as much. But we were able to collect all that data that now gives us an insight into a lot of things. So data, as someone, someone said, is now the new oil of the economy. Because when you have the data, you can mine it, you can, you can predict, there is predictive analysis, and there are things that would benefit our lives. So connectivity becomes key. Some of the uh, key uh, solutions that we are trying to put in place, uh, there's a company by the name of Vanubos that I worked with in the past. They are doing a portable uh, uh, remote uh, backend, which we actually connect, you know, to your main main line in, in partnership. What's the name, Julius? Vanu, Vanu okay. Bose, V-A-N-U. Actually, most of you know Vanu. I mean, you know the Bose uh, speakers, B-O-S-E. And um, Vanu Bose is the son of Mr. Uh, Dr. Vanu, who, by his own right, actually is a software engineer. My, uh, he's a close friend of mine. Unfortunately, he passed away a couple of, uh, I think, about six months ago. You know, unfortunately, but he came up with this uh, portable radio. I mean, uh, uh, which is the back end of your connectivity. Mm -hmm. It's been piloted in uh, 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 Rwanda and also in um, uh, Zimbabwe, where you can connect most of the rural area. And then you just truncate it to the main, you know, to the main uh, supplier in in the city. So uh, there's a there's a whole um, technological capability and enableness that is going on at the back end uh, because we all recognize that if you can't connect them, then we lose them. So and in order to bring all of the benefit of what I just talked about, you can't have a price discovery of your produce at the remote area if you cannot connect. So that becomes key, and we are, we are trying to solve that problem. Okay, thank you. I want to add oh. to that. You know, it, Susan. Even in the cities, like the cost of data access in Africa is some of the highest in the world. So there's a big need. The poorest people you know, are paying the most to get one gigabyte of data. So there is a really big challenge in upgrading the speed of networks and the cost of data really throughout the continent. And I think to capture a lot of the benefits, I guess we're going to talk about. We're starting right. with the pessimism first. But, right, right. Uh, <laughs> we're, it's, it's a big challenge. I mean, it's as important as roads and ports and mm -hmm. energy. Well, energy is the other point. Yeah. The internet doesn't work uh, without electricity. Right. So those of us who live in Washington and our power goes out regularly <laughs> understand this. So. Um, <laughs> 
you know, building out the electrical grids in a way that's cost efficient and reliable remains a huge challenge. Yeah, the two work hand in hand. Um, Mary. Yeah, right. So then there's two pieces of this and you can be optimistic or pessimistic about it, but part of it, so there is, a, there's an investment gap, right? There is an enormous amount of resources that still need to be put into, uh, I'm going to sort of some of these infrastructure sectors, um, but it is estimated by some work from colleagues at the, at the World Bank that half of that gap is actually due to regulatory costs. So there is a gap on infrastructure, but there's incredible cost because of the nature of regulations, the lack of competition, the nature under which certain um, companies are able to operate. And so I think there's clearly a need for investment. There's a lot of initiative being put trying to bring more private investors in. The terms of that matter enormously. Uh, but then also working on the political side to change some of the regulations that would likewise introduce a bit more competition and uh, sharpen those incentives to be able to extend the services in price competitive ways to larger share of the, of the economy and population. Yeah, I often hear that framed under creating the enabling environment uh, for these kind of things to flourish. So thank you. I want to move back to manufacturing and uh, a bit of a technical point for Mary and Olga. At, at what point do you or don't you consider manufacturing an industry 4.0 um, practice or sector? Should I? Okay. I'll just give, give you a flavor of the last week discussion in Bonn initiated by the German government of uh, whether we can still call manufacturing manufacturing today. So there is dilemma how the sectoral classification in a linear way, as you put it, are still valid in the digital economy, which is very disruptive in the sense blurring the differences between the sectors, economic sectors. From agriculture, we are witnessing industrialization of agriculture. You can say mano agriculture or whatever coin we can use it. And I have visited recently also vertical farms in China. There is no land at all. It just plucks this case is full of, land, of uh, earth in the space like this, and they substitute I don't know how many hectares of land. But they produce tons and tons of tomato, which is all using Industry 4.0. So the same holds now also if we consider that, then the services part of manufacturing is also taking over some functions from manufacturing, like logistics. They are also doing assembly. And then we have also blurring the differences in the academic sciences. So you have nano, bio, cogno, and that are also penetrating in agriculture, in manufacturing, and so on. So in the world without sectors, how we can say what is the future of industrialization in Africa? I think what one should not ignore is that the industry today is driven by global value chains, globalization of, of production. And globalization of production is driven by new technologies. And then we will witness restructuring in global value chains, offshoring, inshoring, uh, will be changed due to these new technologies. So can you imagine, first of all, one example, there are a lot of labor intensive uh, investment in Ethiopia in leather industry. And China is investing there, while at the same time China is leading in robotics. And what is the advantage of producing things with robots is, first of all, there is a lower production cost, uh, low um, level of mistakes, so that means very high quality of products, and most importantly, customization. I don't know if you are aware of the fact that um, young generation wanted to have a Nike that is customized their own needs, and they order this to the internet. It cost like $360 a couple of years back, but now it's $30, $30. so you can customize it. And now there is a lot of investment in Ethiopia, and I ask also my colleagues in Germany, can Ethiopians produce Nike for my daughter? Are, are they going to be able to do this just in time? So lots of investment in that, but connecting to the global value chain in leather, they should be very, very fast in, up, uh, in uptake of these new technologies advancement. And again, this is driven by big capital. And, uh, uh, next issue is whether China would continue to invest in Ethiopia in low cost uh, production of shoes and leather products, or their products produced in China will compete with those products in Ethiopia because it will be much cheaper. And this is the crucial issue. 
because one day if machines are taking over to produce these things, then all the investment there will be, uh, you can question it, okay, but they will be produced because it's cheap labor force in, uh, in Ethiopia and in Africa, but the things will be cheaper for them. It will be more expensive to produce in Africa than in other parts of the world. So <coughs> therefore, Africa should never be marginalized under these circumstances. They have to be uh, part of the whole system and to think how they will adapt quickly and use whatever they have learned in this stage of development, <coughs> industrial development in these countries, and adapt again to the next stage. Whatever this is, it could be that they can customize product to the local needs, but with the help of new technologies. I just want to pause there and, and we'll come back to that because that starts to touch upon the, the other half of this topic in terms of, you know, Industry 4.0 is a hindrance. Mary, we talked a little bit uh, before the event about, you know, your thoughts on when or if manufacturing is actually something that's considered Industry 4.0 and I was hoping you could share that. So I, I think, I mean, there's a range of definitions, which is presumably why you're asking this question, but often it's sort of seen as this interface between the cyber and physical worlds. So if 3.0 was, was some bringing in ICT and some of the more advanced robotics, the 4.0 is, this is sort of all connected. So they're smart robots and they have the sensors and it's much more digitally driven uh, and sort of feedback loops. And so that's sort of, I mean, plus you have the nano and all kinds of other different things. Um, but so, so it is sort of a level of sophistication and use of technology that would sort of set it on one side. But, but I think Olga raises a number of really important points, which other kinds of things, this sort of distinction of agriculture, services, and manufacturing absolutely are blurring. And Industry 4.0 explicitly sort of blurs a chunk of those lines because it brings a lot of services very much embodied and embedded into manufacturing. It's not unique to 4.0. And I, and I think that is actually something that's important to think about when you think about a development path for Africa is an increasingly important synergies between, between these different sectors. So with this customization, there's more room for design and tailoring of different products for local tastes, for local inputs. Uh, and those are, in some sense, services. If you're building on agricultural products or other natural resources, some of that can be in this agri-processing. There's all the marketing and the financial services and the insurance and different things that go afterwards. And to the extent if it is a sort of 4.0 and you have sort of digital technology sort of looping back, those are, again, are all services that come after purely the putting it together industry part. So this sort of service components, even within manufacturing, are an increasingly important scope for it. So when Africa is thinking about industrializing, it shouldn't only be thinking about sort of making components and assembling components. Increasingly where the value is, is in these services before and after that. And so they, they have what they call a smile curve because it has a very sophisticated U shape, like a smile. Um, but basically, the low point of that in terms of where the value added comes is in that manufacturing production, and the upper sort of smile parts are these services that are embedded, and that that shape has been sort of deepening over time. So when Africa thinks not just of industrializing but moving up in the value chain, increasingly that means moving into these kinds of services. So even within Industry 4.0, that's got to be a big part of the agenda for Africa. So, so one quick thing, and anybody can follow up on this, but on, on the hindrance side, is there a threat, is there a possibility that um, the global development of automation, of you know, robotic manufacturing, could, could be a hindrance to manufacturing that's taking root in some African countries like Ethiopia, or even in Nigeria, uh, before they're able to really turn these things into employment drivers. I mean, I, I, sure. <laughs> who would you Any, like to anybody? <laughs> Go ahead, Susan, we'll, we'll come back. Well, I would say we talk about manufacturing, but it's important to think about the different sub-segments. And I know this is in Mary's book, it's some work we did. The types of manufacturing that we call globally foot, footloose are labor-intensive textiles, shoes, toys, and then consumer electronics. Um, but in, the, in everything that's produced, that's only 20% of the global value added in manufacturing is truly agnostic of where it's produced. 
uh, and it could be in Africa, it could be in China. So that's a small piece. There's a lot of manufacturing that happens, like food processing, commodities uh, processing, et cetera, that's tied to a location. So food processing, where the food is grown, where the consumers are. Commodities processing, where commodities are dug out of the ground, which Africa has a lot of. So I think that there is opportunity even if you say, okay, robots are going to dominate production in China, global value chains are not going to move. Uh, they're just going to substitute people with robots for these very tradable goods. There's still opportunity in Africa for the things that are heavy and difficult to ship around. Um, so I, I'd like to say I think there is some, some uh, opportunity particularly okay. in the short term, but even in the very long term, there will be manufacturing in Africa. It's going to be a different development path than what you saw in China, where they really use this export industry to drive growth. It's going to be more regionally focused. Uh, let, let me piggyback on that. Um, uh, as we were talking about the uh, 4.0, I, I agree with everything we said so far. However, I think when we, just like we look at 1.0, 2, 3, and so on, the implementation of 4.0 in African countries is going to be different. Yes, it, it different in the sense that, yes, there will be robotic, all of the technology, enabling technologies are going to be there, but there will be a different process of implementation that says, okay, we are not just going to throw in, you know, a robotic, for example, to go and harvest, you know, on the, on the cocoa farm a cocoa farm that has never had any digitization before. So that's not going to happen. Where we have a high population of youth that are unemployed, that's not going to happen. Part of what we are trying to do is to make agriculture I mean, a, a, a tech-savvy environment where the youth will be proud and uh, energized to be able to go to the farm. Today, almost close to zero of any graduating student want to go back to the farm because they believe the farm is, you know, is, is a poor job to do. If you empower that with technology, yes, I see 4.0 as an empowering uh, uh, capability. Give them transparency, give them uh, 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 value, you know, that, I mean, uh, less labor intensive values that, you know, that, that is gonna help them. But by the same token, you know, to, to your point, when we look at the enormous amount of opportunity and you know, are we owning more on the, on the uh, commodity side? Just to give you a sense of it, so uh, a couple of years ago, I started a project. We look at the total commodity produced and traded in the US. And um, in year 2011, some of you may be aware of this, if you trade in commodities, there's about $3.5 trillion of physical <laughs> commodities. And I want to be very specific on that, $3.5 trillion only of Physical commodities, if you have to deliver that commodity tomorrow, you have it in physical terms and you can deliver them. But guess what? The notion and value of those commodities, meaning all of the financial transactions associated with it, futures, contracts, and so on, it amounts to $37.5 trillion. I mean, do you get, I mean, I want that point to sink in. From 3.5 physical commodity to 37.5 notional value of commodities. That's more than 10 times. Now, Africa hasn't traded in that yet. So if you look at the uh, uh, capabilities and the commodities that are available for Africa to trade and the enabling technology you can bring in to trade that commodity, let's say we only have one-tenth of that. One tenth of that with a power of let's say 50%. Right. That will change the GDP of Africa forever. Poverty will be gone. Man, not absolutely. But when you are looking at a multiplier of more than 10, 10 times in commodity trading, that's not something you need to go and find. They're already there. And all you need to do is empower the people with technology to be able to do that. And that's why we are bringing some of the, you know, the blockchain. The, the, when you combine blockchain with the uh, uh, power of mobile capability that have been so pervasive in the continent, again, uh, uh, we all talk about internet. Internet is not just one technology. It's a zone of components of technologies, the IP 
protocol, the hardware, the software, and so on. So we will need all of these technologies that come together to be able to empower that and unleash that hidden uh, uh, agenda or hidden asset that I believe is still sitting in African well, countries. Let me break to kind of a, a critical question here in terms of this topic, because we're really talking about you know, improving people's lives. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that there's been a lot of progress, especially in some particular countries in Africa over the last decade. But I just want to ask the panel, uh, and we can solve the, the panel question right here, on a net basis in terms of improving people's lives in Africa and bringing African, certain African countries to the global economic stage, does anybody see uh, Industry 4.0 on a net basis as a hindrance to the continent or countries? On a net basis, we're not right. talking particular example. May I ask one uh, important yeah. dimension that uh, we all uh, ignored right. about demography in uh, Africa okay. and urbanization trends. So the most people in Africa will go to live in cities, not in a rural area. And on a net basis, what will be the effect of not embracing new technologies if you live in cities, if all Africans are going to live in cities? So you have to embrace new technologies because if you don't do that, Africa will remain the weakest link in economic development scene. No sustainable development goals to be realized. And this high concentration of population will have to use this technology to live better, to have a, well, a better uh, um, well-being of, of the citizen, the city in terms of utilities, in terms of producing goods. What goods that they are going to produce in urban area, that's, that's the issue. So my, my answer is a little complicated. <laughs> so okay. um, if you take the sort of digital piece of it, uh, which isn't necessarily the industry, but can be seen as part of the, quote, new technology, disruptive technology, I think the scope to increase people's welfare and quality of life is, is large, right? From a range of services that can be delivered far more inclusively and efficiently and low cost, uh, it can be government services, it can be transfer payments, it can be information about prices, it can be some health services, some education services. Uh, you know, and the marginal cost of delivery can be almost zero, right? So I think all of that has enormous potential to improve the quality of life. Yeah. Do I think it makes the bar higher in terms of pure sort of manufacturing? I do. So do I think it is going to be harder for Africa to really industrialize and have that be a big part of their development strategy? I think the challenge is higher. Now, that may motivate some countries to make some of these other kinds of changes, which could inspire and change things. But I think it does raise the bar. On the other hand, I think there is really a lot of scope in some of the agro-processing, in some parts of manufacturing that aren't as 4.0, and in services. So I don't think, I think on net it can be positive, but I think that the little industry part is probably a bigger challenge. Yeah, so Thanks, let Mary. Me, let me just say quickly. Okay. Uh, I believe the net is, it has to be positive. It has to be. And the reason I believe it has to be is because you can't start at such a low level without a significant increment. Okay, it may not be, you know, in absolute terms, it may not be comparable to the Western world, but let me just hit on two key things. Transparency. When you bring technology that gives you transparency, transparency in the sense of, for example, gender equalization. You have a lot of women that are working on the farm, breaking their back, selling the product. Most of that you don't, you don't record anywhere. What if we record that in the GDP? What impact would that be? Then secondly, I mean, again, as we said before, you have price transparency. You have, you know, we are bringing in you know, agri-tech that is making it far more attractive to the youth that are coming out of schools. And when you roll all of that up and you get the private sector involved, it has to be positive. I'm not saying it will be, you know, far beyond expectation, but I'm a maybe eternally uh, optimistic guy from Africa. It has to be positive. It's good to be positive. I, th I think a follow-up panel is, is there's a flip side of this mixed bag uh, tech equation. Maybe a follow-up panel, Brahima, is on data privacy in Africa, but we'll save that <laughs> for another day. Uh, I wanted to get to, to uh, moving to some specific examples, uh, and I wanted to ask Susan a question about fintech. And, uh, you know, we've seen fintech actually be one of the first things to really register in Africa with global application. And you know, people are probably tired of hearing about M-Pesa. But there are a lot of other uh, fintech applications that are scaling. 
And the question would be to Susan, I know you've done work on this, the power of fintech, fintech platforms to unlock economic potential to the continent and you know, this huge group of people who are unbanked on the continent. Yeah. Yeah, well, good. I'm glad we're getting to the optimistic side yeah. of things. So, so why are we even talking about this? Because it does offer entirely new models of business. So you've all heard of M-Pesa, the mobile money service in Kenya that's really taken off. Um, and here's an example of a technology that's much more advanced, I'd say, in Kenya than it is in the United States. So this is a perfect example of leapfrogging, of an entirely different way of doing financial services. Um, it starts with not even internet access. All you need is a dumb phone, a flip phone, and mobile phone connectivity, which there is very high penetration of, higher than internet access. So without a smartphone, you can already start to send and receive payments on your phone. Now it's clumsy. You have to type in a whole string of, of numbers to get your payment going to where it's going or receiving it. But it's a way for people who don't have access to a branch bank, which is very expensive, to start to accumulate sums of money. So on top of this basic platform, there's been an explosion of other applications. Um, when you add a smartphone to the mix, it all gets much easier. And then you start to track the digital data. Right. So now there are startups that will say, we can assess your credit score based on um, how you're using your smartphone. Sometimes it's tracking your payments in and out. Sometimes it's just tracking who you're calling. Do you call your mother? Do you call your friends? And, and using big data analysis, figuring out that you can somewhat accurately predict people's credit scores. People who never had a credit score, who had no access to a loan, can now get a loan. So if you're a, so if you're a merchant in a market, um, you now have access to loans for your business. Um, another application, if you're a small shopkeeper and you start to collect digital payments via a smartphone application, kind of like Square in this country. So you can take um, digital payments as you sell goods. Well, this opens up a whole array of business applications for that small shop owner, because now he has a record of what he's sold. Uh, he can start to analyze it. He knows at the end of the week he needs to reorder X amount of these shampoos versus you know these apples, etc. Um, he can start to analyze and do some simple marketing. What days of the week does he sell shampoo versus apples? he can start to suddenly understand who are his best customers. So all these applications at big companies literally took the last 20 years. It's called enterprise software development. And they've spent hundreds of millions of dollars being able to analyze this stuff. If you're Coca-Cola or Pepsi, you can now do with a smartphone if you have the payment of digital, if you have the, the record of digital payments in and out of your shop. So. That's the potential, is that this is where digital and the internet is breaking open to small companies and small businesses that don't have the money to get their own in-house team of developers to develop proprietary data that the huge companies do. Suddenly, you can improve your productivity and, and then, of course, also go to the bank and show them what you're revenues are to get a loan. So that is, those are just two examples of like the suite of things that are built on top of mobile payments and digital finance that makes it really transformative. And the other thing, a really great example off the back of this, you talked about secondary applications to uh, payments platforms. The example I like to use is that you now also have credit rating apps and platforms sprouting up in places like Nigeria. And the, the example that Joyce always hits me about, you know, untapped or, or locked up economic potential is that renters in Nigeria, because of the lack of credit ratings, mm -hmm. they're often required to give up to two years okay. of a forward deposit mm -hmm. <laughs> for the properties they're renting. And the excuse that many of the proprietors give is that because of a formal lack of a formal credit rating process, we need that kind of, kind of security. So think about how much unlocked, for a country you know, reaching 200 million people, how much unlocked economic potential there is of people leaving two years of rent um, just locked in some proprietor's account. Um, 
Yes, Mary. So I think the other, the other dimension which we haven't talked about is the skills question. Yes, absolutely. And, and the question is sort of what kind of skills are needed? So often the first thing people, you know, oh, technology, more skills. And, for, and certainly if you want to be the one programming these and, you know, developing the apps, or developing, you know, sophisticated devices, you need STEM skill, STEM skills, right? And it's very skill intensive, right? But we don't have need to make the phone or make the app to use it, and this ability to use a number of these apps may require a certain basic sort of numeracy or literacy, but it provides in the app all kinds of skills that you no longer have to acquire, right? You don't need the MBA to be able to do this kind of analysis. And not necessarily on the flip phone, but on even basic smartphone, you don't actually have to be that literate or numerate because it does a lot of the payments for you. It can do these projections for you. It can use a lot of icons. So in some sense, it's an incredible skill booster and productivity booster for those really at the lower end. So this idea that everybody has to be more skilled, I think is actually not true. It's gonna be empowering a lot of people without very high skill to be far more productive than they would otherwise. So it can be a really inclusive on that dimension as well. Thank you. Just want a point of housekeeping. Rahima, how much time do we have before Q&A? I think we have a bit over half an hour. Okay. May I just add to Okay, okay. Um, why, why don't we do why don't we do two more questions? Olga will let you get in. To add to this one very good point because it's this polarization of labor force that everybody is discussing of that you will have um, high wage uh, demand for high wage paid jobs and are very low skilled but not in between which will uh, uh, tremendously uh, hurt um, middle class. Yeah? And middle class is very bad if you don't have it for democracy for example. And therefore they said okay for this uh, new digital economy you need STEM qualification but there is ongoing debate that this is not true, particularly the robots, they don't have creativity and robots, they don't have emotions. So this is where humans are more, let's say, superior over machines and tools. And therefore there are discussion of stems, that art should be part of this, that the creativity part should be also used and particularly for specialization and for adaptations to the taste is of locality. So that means African have a lot of potential there. You don't have resources, but you have a lot of creativity. Creativity should be leveraged in this new context. This should not be ignored. But I agree with Susan, so that means education system, regional innovation system, science technology innovation system completely have to be revisited in African countries and also educational system should be revisited. So this is extremely important and I think also global community should work together on this. This could be a very negative externality for the global community. Therefore, we should have some collective actions on this education, education and connectivity. I think yeah. we didn't touch this uh, communication protocols and industry 4.0 traditional one of 5G and how wireless technology is expensive or non-expensive for, for Africa to leapfrog in this. I think it's a very, very important one. Yeah, so much to cover on this topic. Uh, just one or two more questions and I wanna open it up to the audience. So I wanna throw this at the panel. In terms of maybe one or two African governments or countries uh, that you think have done the best, both at the private sector level and at the policy level to enable industry 4.0 development uh, sectors. Uh, I'd be curious to see uh, which two, one or two countries uh, panelists would, would name. Um, well, I, I, I take a lead on that. So um, I'm reluctant, I would say, to even name anyone, but uh, since I have no name one, um, I would say Rwanda is, seems to be doing well, and I will tell you my reason why I'm not the type that just um, point on the country. Um, one of the key uh, undervalued assets on the planet today, I think, is the land asset of African countries. Okay, if you look at the African country today, if anybody ever read uh, Anando De Soto's um, Ministry of Poverty, the most recent, you know, we work with them directly. The most recent publication he had, they had somewhere like $20 trillion of assets, mostly in the developing world. I would say, conservatively, one third of that on the African continent that are just sitting. He called them dead assets. I call them, coming from banking, dormant assets. They are dormant. They need to be waking up and mobilized. So if you take that 
And you look at the value of that, and we talk about uh, uh, leveraging the asset, being able to go to the bank. Those are things we could leverage, we can put to motion, okay, that we are not doing yet. That's why I strongly believe, you know, Ford Auto is going to enable us to be able to do that. Rwanda, you know, we are working with Rwanda to actually um, record those assets on the blockchain. And it's a project I've been working on for more than five years, even long before blockchain. Now blockchain is over. So we are going to pour that into blockchain. We are going to mobilize it and then let the owners be able to uh, monetize that and then use it for you know, better life. So I would think that they, they are getting there. I mean, are they really there? I mean, by my uh, standard, I think they are below average, but they are still the best. Any other thoughts on top one or two countries that are definitely getting uh, Industry 4.0 development right or, or even wrong? What about well, South I'd Africa? Say. South Africa has a leading in automotive industry, huh? yeah. parts and components. So they are going to establish a very soon center for Industry 4.0. We are working with them on this. They are very keen to have a strategy, a digital strategy for the future of the country. And infrastructure is quite well in uh, South Africa and attracting foreign direct investment there. So big data is going to work in automotive industry in South Africa. Susan? I would say <coughs> Morocco, although I'm hesitant to name a single country. Mm, okay. But I would say Morocco, and not so much because of Industry 4.0, but Industry 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0, that they've really gotten right in a very systematic way that now has positioned them to okay. um, compete. So I'm going to sort of two things. So I mean, on the Barry? one hand, this is less the industry than the digital. I mean, so Kenya came up in part I was surprised of nobody raised Kenya, but so, yeah. And, and it has a very lively sort of internet entrepreneurship culture. Yeah. Uh, a lot of incubators, a lot of foreign investors sort of looking at this at a, and NGOs looking at it. So in the sort of digital space, it's quite good. You also raised the policy question, and I think that's important because while M-Pesa on the one hand is the poster child, yeah. um, they've had some anti-competitive uh, behavior and really trying to shut out other companies from being able to offer rival services. It became a legal issue and a political issue. And uh, it has been resolved, I think, in a way for the most part that actually is a good thing for Kenya going forward to allow more interoperability of data and some more competition. I mean, they have 70 plus percent of the market share, and that's pretty rare that one provider would have that. So, so, on the one, so does it have the industry piece of it? Not, not as much. So I, at least for, uh, at the World Bank, there are now 10 countries that have come sort of wanting to really take part in the Digital Economy for Africa um, initiative. And Senegal is one, which again may not yeah. be on people's radars <coughs> as, as the, the prime one. But they are really wanting a digital strategy. And so they are coming everything from the infrastructure and the connectivity uh, to the services, to the payments, to the whole sort of set. And they really are coming politically very open to, OK, we want to take this agenda seriously. They're not a manufacturing powerhouse. It's not only manufacturing, but right. they really want to see what would it take for Senegal to be transformed. Uh, Ghana's on that list. Kenya's on the list. So there's a Cote d'Ivoire is on the list. So there's a range of potential in it, but it is a whole, just even compared to a year ago, let alone before that, it is something that has caught a lot more policymakers as well as the public's and private sector investors' imagination. So there's an opening to really sort of think, okay, so how do, if one takes this seriously and as a large scale agenda and not just tech in this specific area, it's a really interesting opportunity to see how transformative as a development strategy can be. So good concluding point. I would, oh, I go would ahead, actually Sarah. add, I wanna end, like when you talk about countries, so I was yeah. on a panel on this topic, um, I think six months ago or 12 months ago, and there was a venture capitalist based in Washington who invests in Africa. And this was his quote for the audience was, I'm really bullish on Chad. <laughs> right? So it's like, the, this, this is the point, is that there are entrepreneurs and startups, there are pockets of opportunity everywhere. And he was going big on Chad. Right. So this is something like that South before, Africa, right, right. Nigeria, Kenya. That's old. That's you know five years ago. Like so, uh, there are pockets of opportunity everywhere. So regardless of what governments are doing right or not right, like there is there is potential. Well, good concluding point. And you know, I'll just say before we move to questions, a great thing on this is in my book I talked about how you're starting to see African governments compete and feel a sense of competition and pressure from investors and their people to actually compete 
on these factors, on technology, on their ability to foster ICT, uh, you know, foster entrepreneurs, you know, bring in foreign investment. And I think by and large, that's a pretty positive development. So on to questions. Uh, I'd ask that uh, if people could identify themselves and hopefully uh, put their, their, their statement in the form of a question, that would be great. So why don't we start, we'll start with this gentleman here. Good morning. Thank you. You had a very, very interesting uh, discussion. My name is uh, Dr. Malcolm Beach. I'm with the Africa Business League, and I have a simple question. Recently, 44 African nations signed a uh, continental free trade agreement. Do you think that's going to have any impact on the standards and the processes that you're talking about with industrialization 4.0? Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's hugely important because no individual African country, maybe Nigeria is the exception, is really big enough to have a vibrant market, particularly for industry, that gives economies of scale. So having groups of countries create a free trade zone is just hugely important. Yeah, I mean, the, I, I agree with we have, but let, let's be clear, though. There are free uh, trade zones already in different areas of Africa, the South, the uh, ECOWAS, the East, the North, and all that kind of thing. Even with that, even with that, we have roughly, if I remember the figure correctly, there's about 26% of total African trade within Africa, meaning you, know, you have the 74% that is Africa to outside of Africa. So having a unified open border, I believe that will increase that, that element. It's not that it's new, but the more universal they make it, the better it becomes. Then you can have intercontinent trade, which I think is, is, uh, is critical. You don't need to have flowers made in Ethiopia, shipped to Europe, and then shipped back to Nigeria, which is what happened you know, uh, uh, currently. So by having that open trade policy, I, I would say across the whole continent, not just the regional segments, that's not enough. It's a good thing, but it's not enough. So if we have it for the total con continent, I would say yes, that will have a big impact. Why don't we go, we'll do room parity here. Uh, the gentleman in the back, please. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Ram Janikir. I work on digital solutions for agriculture. I think some so of the panel- bring the mic up a little? Some more, of the please. panel members emphasized uh, uh, the role of young people to get into agriculture in Africa, where the productivity levels are extremely low compared to, say, even 10 years ago. So what can be done to improve the digital skills of the young people and also to improve efficiency along the agriculture value chain, all the way from farm planning to land preparation to input usage, where the efficiency levels are extremely low, to uh, marketing of agricultural products? There are many digital solutions in each of these spaces where it can generate a lot of data and also provide them with real-time advisory services. Uh, so what more can be done to So digital skills in agriculture in particular? And increasing efficiency along the value chain. Yeah. Okay. Who wants to jump at that one? I mean, so I think there's a, there is a whole range of things, right, from sort of satellite information that can t pinpoint you know, the quality of soil and what kind of fertilizer and the right sort of, based on weather patterns, the right time to be planting, to harvest. There's all kinds of big data that can be harvested, uh, you know, with, again, simple apps um, that can be used to increase yields. There's a lot being done on platforms, both in terms of sort of renting farm machinery, right, that can be very capital intensive and doesn't make economic sense for individual farmers to have, but it helps with a sort of an efficient distribution. So there's sort of services in renting the machinery to the sort of Uber for harvesting to get to market. Um, and this comes back a little bit to this regulatory point again, that logistics and transportation, as well as on the ICT, are often one of the most regulated sectors in many countries in the continent uh, to the detriment of many, including farmers. And so in terms of you know, the, the share of harvest that is lost, getting to market is the highest in many African countries than any other in, in any other region. So really being able to have a much more efficient platform in getting trucks to the farmers and to market on a good working timetable are all things where digital could help enormously. 
We have learning by doing, yes. Olga? <laughs> we have forgotten about that, so I think they have just to, to do it. And this is what I said, this machine do not need a lot of knowledge to operate, but through operating with machines and robots, you learn a lot. I think the, the multinational companies that are working in Africa should be also stimulated, incentivized by government to transmit this knowledge also to local labor force, to young people. And then also international organization, we are also trying to develop curricula for the young people, the young, young entrepreneur also in these digital skills, how to use digital means. I think also a big multinational companies like Alibaba is trying also to establish the digital uh, platforms, eco-platform, digital free trade zone even, in connection with the question on WTO issues, yeah. which will make trade facilitation cost minimum, and also cut the transaction cost. So young people can have a possibility to learn that by doing it. And lifelong learning for everybody. Eh? And I'd also just throw in, look at drone surveillance, uh, which is actually starting to play a role in many countries in terms of uh, agriculture. And there's a company called Rocket Mine in South Africa that's mm -hmm. a good example. Next question. Let's take the lady right here. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for your presentation. My name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm the president of Seguero's International Group. I focus on small and medium businesses and agriculture, looking at manufacturing in, in, uh, here in America State. I'm part of the U.S. Congress Manufacturing Caucus, Making America Great. But I want to talk about Africa now. How do we, looking at your wonderful presentation, uh, at, during the World Bank Spring Meeting, we listened to the UNTAC Secretary, Dr. Mohisa Kitui, on industrialization and the robots, talking what we are talking here. And I'm asking the same question. Why do I focus on small and medium businesses? We have a missing link here. We are talking here. We, there is no collaboration between the World Bank, the UNTAC, the UN, the World Bank, the farmers, and the civil society like me, and the diaspora. We have wonderful st universities in Africa, wonderful universities who don't need to come for research to America to know what they want to do. How do we make this collaboration between the civil society, the African diaspora themselves, the experts and the policy makers <laughs> like you here, my Brookings, and the people with money, World Bank, to invest more into small and medium businesses, farmers, and work with me? Because we are talking here, the farmer doesn't know, the small business doesn't know, and if we are talking here, when we leave here, it's ended until the next meeting. So how can this collaboration be there on the ground with the leaders themselves, from the president, the ministers of agriculture, the ministers of trade, the ministers of finance? How do we make this happen? Because when the robots come, there'll be no jobs. The same youth we are talking about, there'll be no jobs. So, and then they'll be fighting people, you call them terrorism. And there are no jobs, the robots have taken over. So we should look at this very, very well, looking as an African woman who grew up on the farm, taking, and then you bring in robots. There is no job for me, there is no job for the youth. So how do we need that collaboration and coordination? We want from now, take my card. If you don't call me from tomorrow, I'll put you on the air on, on media. So thank you so much. So how do we collaborate? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Julius? Sure. Um, um, well, I mean, one thing I know for sure, uh, there's the SME Forum, and I'm a member of that. And that's, actually, that's headed by the World Bank. You know, it's under the uh, IFC, I, you know, IFC, which is part of the World Bank. Um, and I know there's a lot of activity. As a matter of fact, I know we'll be talking about some of the issues in Riyadh, uh, I believe, in July time frame. So um, there's a connectivity in terms of, you know, disseminating information and how people can help. But personally, what I think is missing is this. Yes, we have a lot of universities in African countries. Yes, we have a lot of innovation and inspiration. I believe what is missing is the fact that the private sector does not see your research institutes and the innovators as partners. Instead, they see that, oh, the academicians, we just leave them on the side. But these are people that are researching this, the problem of today and they are supposed to provide the solution. If the private sector is not collaborating with them, it's a loss-loss situation because the private sector cannot do a lot of the research they can afford to do because they are built to do those research and they are built to fail sometimes and they can absorb the failure. Private sector cannot do that. The way you create solution to existing problem is by taking chances. 
private sector, because of investors, cannot take all of those chances. Be USME or not, you need to connect with an environment that will be able to help you minimize the risk of loss, but give you a high return on, on investment, which is what research institutes like the MITs of the world, the, you know, the Harvard, the Stanford, private sector invest in them, you know, in order to provide solutions to their problems. They, do, they don't just stay away. And that's what we don't do enough in African countries. We think academia is separate from private and we just leave them alone, which is a mistake. Okay, this side of the room, uh, we'll go all the way back to the gentleman waving his hand. And we can hear, that's okay. More questions? Maybe I'll collect the cons. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Shia Jai, and I'm the CEO of Africa Group International. Um, we facilitate trade in Africa, supply chain management, procurement, and investments in West Africa, and most importantly, getting into a new market. My question to everyone is, is America really ready to do business? And why I ask that question is because we've had Indian families in Nigeria for years that have been doing businesses like the Ati Ramani family that owns Dana Group, Vaswani families that own the Stallion Group. So I feel like I want everyone to, to take the step forward in America to come because everyone keeps talking and nobody's taking the walk. China is taking the walk. And my company helps you get into the market. We help you register your company, acquire the land, get you the HR that's going to help you employ people who are actually going to do the best jobs for you. So we are open for business. She also she spoke about, I don't know, she spoke about labor. And in, in regards to labor, in Nigeria, people make $200 a month. So in the U.S., I don't see anyone who's going to live by $200 a month. So anyone can be employed in Africa. The talk about making things in China and shipping them to Africa, that's, that's not true. The, the, the minimum wage in Africa is so low that when you convert your dollars, then you can never live with that money in these parts of the world. But over there, people live there with that, with that amount of money. So we, are, we want companies to come and set up because in the near future, my generation would not accept shipping goods down to Africa. We want it made there. Um, Boeing company sets up a brand new aircraft and completes the aircraft in China, the interiors, the avionics, the, 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 the painting of the aircraft, which can be done in the U.S. But China signs an agreement that we want the aircraft completion done in China so our people can be paid. The same thing goes down with other brand new aircraft from Africa, Kenya Airways, South African Airways. And we also want completion centers in Africa that is actually going to help our people with skills. In the aircraft part of it, we buy business jets from Nigeria, from this part okay, of the can world. Can we do, just to break up the question, the two parts? Okay, and when we try to sell mind. those jets back, it's, it's, it's not good for us in the market. It's, the price is always going down low. So we need people down there to set up factories and to put people into work. And the end of it, the salary you're, you're paying people is just very, very low. So there's no excuse. Thank you very much. So, so just to, I think, break it down, one part was, was how to get more uh, American companies to take advantage of African business opportunities. And then there was a second part on help me out. And I think it was to Olga on, on labor or? Cheap labor in Africa, competing with the, with the robots or products produced somewhere else. Yes, it's a good well, why, don't, why don't we start with the second part, Olga? On? Uh, on, uh, com uh, on labor. On labor, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This, uh, this is a very important one as, as we started all discussion about it. The issue is that you have to produce cheap goods but quality goods. And compare yourself with China. Ten years ago, a lot of cheap goods on the market people were buying. But after a certain point of time, they don't want uh, things that, that are cheap and can break in uh, no time. You want quality stuff to buy because it's, it's more dura durable. So in that sense, yes, Africa can use cheap labor, but it should produce very good quality stuff based on demand of the uh, situation, demand that is uh, today that is a uh, quality and fast, in, just in time. If Africa can do that, as I said, I go back to Nike. If you can produce Nike that can be ordered electronically for, for people, young people that want to buy it, why not? 
but just you have to be able to do it. Well, I'm going to have to get, we're gonna keep it open for everybody. So why don't I take the first part of the question, and Susan, McKinsey's done a lot of work and highlighted a lot of American companies have actually worked in Africa. Maybe an example of two of you know, those companies and what you think drew them in. Well, there are U.S. companies doing business there, but in general, I was telling some of the panelists earlier, American companies are far behind, even far behind relative to European countries. And I hate to say it, but I think the colonial ties of Europe and maybe the time zone, like Europeans are just much more attuned to the opportunity in Africa than Americans have been. It's just a little bit of a blank suit. So a lot of the, a lot of times I do presentations to large companies and I say, what's your Africa strat strategy? And they look at me. Like, what? It's like, yeah, you need an Africa strategy because guess what? Population growth in China is now over. And by 2030 or 2035, Africa is going to have the largest number of people, more than China or India. So the demographics are there. Um, anyway, so I just echo your point that it is. it takes you and the job you're doing to go tell <laughs> companies about it and, and me. And there are some, you know, GE and... You know, there are many, and many of the agribusiness companies, of course, have big operations in Africa. And that's a matter of them seeing the opportunity, GE a lot in power and energy, um, agribusiness, you know, in obvious commodities. Um, so I, th I think it's changing, but um, yeah, U.S. businesses have, this is not a part of the world that they have really historically had any experience in. And the lady right here. Get the mic for you so everyone can is hear. Is my voice not loud enough it is. for you, yeah, my parents? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm Diane Wilkins, uh, President and CEO of Development Finance International. Um, thank you all. Uh, Susan, you didn't mention Lions on the Move, too, which is really yeah. important for folks new. Um, and for uh, you, ma'am, for Germany. I've spent a lot of time in Africa and Hawassa, Ethiopia in particular, so my question relates to that. And congratulations to GIZ and KFW now for how uh, much you're getting involved in the higher skills, and it's really important. And of course, the Trade and Competitiveness Group work closely with PVH Corp and their investment in Hawassa. So here's my question. That's garment and textiles and the largest industrial park for garment and textiles on the continent. Ethiopia thinks it's going to generate 500,000 jobs over the next, I think at this point, three years in garment and textiles. Africa's adding a billion people. I'm glad you brought that point up. So what's, what's your crystal ball? If uh, Africa 4.0 comes in, there will be some subset who's creative and can do the digital economy. There'll be another subset um, of young people who might move back to the farm and get inspired. But for global and political stability, what, what's your crystal ball? What do we see for the other 995 million people? Well, just, just to add a really quick example to your question to, to tee off to the panelists. I had a very cut and dry conversation with Ethiopia's uh, Minister of Industry where he said, look, for us manufacturing, it's a really simple equation. And even then, we have a problem. We have this growing youth labor force, and it's growing by this much. And even if we do manufacturing, we're only going to be able to employ X percentage of that. So you know, it's the only choice for us. But even with that, we still have a huge youth unemployment problem. Which I think, and maybe the panel can elaborate on this, you know, employment is a global problem now, but maybe seemingly bigger for Africa. So who wants to sure. jump on um, that one? I, I see, I've walked over or traveled over the continent. Uh, there's no doubt that we have youth unemployment. And uh, a lot, there's a lot of root problems that is causing that. Uh, not just because of technology displacement. I mean, actually, I think that's the very, very minimal, if at all, impact. Edu the standard of education is a problem, okay? Even you know, in, within countries, you know, I remember, you know, I was for Nigeria, I talked with the Minister of Finance and this and that, you know, over the years, and we used to debate that, look, we have a high unemployment problem because some of the uh, uh, private sector companies within the country will not hire them because they don't have all the qualifications they need. They rather hire somebody from outside. So, and that's not uh, native to Nigeria only. I've done that all, you know, South Africa, everywhere. 
So we need to improve the quality of the education. And I have to admit that the education for Africans were not tailored for Africans. Therefore, they don't solve our problem. And we don't learn the way we are supposed to learn because we have a foreign system of learning where we don't learn by our own, by our own language, which has been proven years and years that when you learn in your own language, you are better off. Now, those are all kind of on the side, but important. But more important to me is now, you know, if you look at Africa, you have a lot of innovation hubs all over the place. Innovation hubs is supposed to bring in the full ecosystem of, of entrepreneurship and business development, which uh, will solve the unemployment problem. We want people to go out and create businesses and employ as opposed to looking for jobs. To do that, you need a nurturing environment that will help them to do that, meaning you, know, you need private sector to private with them. You need you know, angel investors to be able to trust them and invest in them. As I just mentioned, you have research and development that is totally disjointed from the private sector when they need to work together. So is, to me, I see it as a community effort from all sectors, the, the, the unemployed, the government, the private sector. We need to band together. We need to create the environment that we uh, uh, pro I mean, that we promote uh, entrepreneurship. And then, of course, there will be people that will take into agri I mean, agri-tech or fintech or all the other capabilities. But below that, I believe there has to be a private sector support. So, uh, Mary? To me, yeah. Ethiopia raises a, a range of really interesting questions because the model is one that is very state-led. Right? It's not been sort of the foreign investor seeing a real market opportunity, uh, and it's two state-led. Right? So on the one hand, it's the Ethiopian government that has done this, but it's also China. So this has been a very intentional, both government and encouraging certain of their leading companies to come and invest. So it's both been the railway um, to the Djibouti uh, port, which has been critical to be able to export. It's, the, it's the, the construction of the industrial zone in particular. And there have been some interesting choices made. So Ethiopia now has a number of them. Um, some of them are a little bit closer to urban areas than others. Some of them are really out in the middle of nowhere. And so, and almost always, they've brought the entire supply chain. So this is not linked into the domestic Ethiopian economy. So you're not going to get the kind of spillovers, ideally, that you would want in attracting FDI. So you are underscoring the, the jobs, and that's, that has been a prime uh, motivator. I think the idea is that it would snowball and it would eventually attract local firms and have the dynamic spillovers. But at the moment, some of that investment has not been set up very well for it. And some of the concern on the jobs has been enormous turnover. And so to me, that's sort of an, a question. Uh, and partly, the wages are incredibly low. And if wages were a little bit higher, that might change some of it. But you've got a lot of people having to move from home to live and work there. And that's had some social cost uh, dimensions as well. So it, it, is, it has uh, had some success in terms of attracting some investors. And there are exporting. <coughs> It hasn't yet reached that tipping point where it's, it's clear that the sort of market forces are really going to make it all sustainable. So, so we have I'm time not sure for it's something two, for a lot of others to copy. Two quick responses, and then we have to wrap. Uh, the Olga and then Susan. Forces, I don't know. Again, we are going into this uh, direction, whether market forces, role of government, what role of market forces in digital economy. That's number one. And in the case of Africa, because there were drivers, government is driver in the whole process in Ethiopia. And there is also a role of government of China, which I agree. But what about the role of Germany in supporting Industry 4.0? It's a very strong power of the government who was initiating the whole term of Industry 4.0 to mobilize stakeholders around the project of Industry 4.0. It's a Fraunhofer society. It is also Siemens. It is a government. You have a lot of subsidies invested into it. It's not market forces. It's a lot of government. But what I want to say is collective things are very important. It's just not a role of government. Collective efficiency of mobilizing all stakeholders is extremely important, and particularly not only for Africa, but, but different countries, developing countries, LDCs. And how do you do that? Because what are the keystones in the certain, uh, let's say, business digital ecosystem? What will be the keystone in Africa is Ethiopian government. But on the whole continent, you have these regional integration schemes. You can talk whether they are successful or not, how they can mobilize this collective efficiency for the whole continent. That's the issue.
because it's a lot of capital in, in Africa, but you have to leverage it for the benefit of all people. And Susan, we just have one moment for you, if you, you had something. I, I was just going to build on Mary's point that economic development is about these spillover effects. You're never going to have everyone employed in agriculture or manufacturing, but if it works well, you're going to be building an economic cluster that has suppliers, it has downstream customers, then you need bankers and financing, you need accountants, you need lawyers, you need a whole set of services. And so the hope, if it works, is that industrialization and manufacturing is the spearhead that then has these ripple effects and you have a whole diversified economy. And that's where most of the young people get their jobs. I think as Mary pointed out though, to have that work, and it's what you saw in China, right? They started out with special economic zones on the coast, but those turned into major cities. Because when people have wages and they wanted better apartments and better food and so on. So they've got to somehow be linked to the local economy if you're going to capture that. Otherwise, it's going to be like so many special economic zones around the world that have actually failed because they were isolated enclaves that didn't, do, it didn't have any connections to the broader local economy. All right, that wraps up our Industry 4.0 Africa discussion at Brookings. I just want to thank the panelists in Brookings for the discussion, and I'm sure we've hit a lot of uh, points to uh, continue discussing after. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.